give thanks to the Lord for it this morning. My well born grandson. My well born grandson. Is that coming soon? Is that from Friday? Oh, praise God. Okay. And what's the little guy's name? surgery a week from Monday. Okay. And for his daughter Chrissy, who is a donor. Oh wow. Wonderful. So is that when you went sir? A week from Monday, a week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow. Okay. Great that goes well. Also, Porter's 
Sunday school. Lord, the harvest sale is coming up. It's an important fundraiser for the school. We pray for that event, Lord, that it might be a successful one. So that it will be not only a good time, a fellowship together, and that sort of thing, but also successful in terms of raising money for the school. We're thankful for it. This <laughs> one Christian. I'm thankful for it in my own life. My children went there and had the privilege of serving on the board, and I'm thankful, Lord, for the school. I pray your blessing, Lord. And then, Lord, we pray for the people here. We give you thanks to Phyllis. It's here this morning. There are times that we're not able to be gathered with your people because of illness or other things going on in our lives. And when we're able to come back, it's so good. It's so good. We miss being in your house. It, it's a part of our life, Lord. A good part. Your word tells us, too, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Because it's important. We need to build each other up, strengthen each other, encourage each other. Challenge each other. So Lord, we give you thanks for each person who's here. Give you thanks for those maybe who haven't been able to be here but are here now. And Lord, um, we give you thanks for that little boy that was born. Anna and Jared's son. You already know his name, Lord. You've known it before he was conceived. You know it before the foundations of the world, Lord. We give you thanks for him. We give you thanks for every little baby that's born in the congregation. We pray for us as a church that we might be the sort of place where these children can grow up in your fear. That we might be the sort of people that are bringing encouragement to them. We they might early seek your face and commit their lives to you. Lord, we pray for Fred and for his daughter, I believe it was. Fred, as he receives kidney a week from tomorrow, his daughter, she gives that kidney. I pray that it's a successful surgery for both of them. And pray, Lord, that it, that it's successful, not just the immediate surgery, but that the result of it, Lord, is good in Fred's life. We still depend on you. Every one of us does. In times like that, we realize it's so deeply. Our lives are in your hand, O oh Lord. Hold us up. And now, Lord, hear our voices as we join our voices together in praying the prayer that we learned, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let's worship the Lord with tithes and offerings given to him.
longer is that I need me every hour? It's a celebration of the moment, is Can we send it before we have the message? I need the number because it's not going to be on the screen. 638? 638. I need thee every hour. Oh, precious Lord. Um, let's stand when the music starts and let's sing that, shall we?
And it seems that as soon as they get there, things start falling apart. First, Elimelech dies and is buried in a pagan land. That's, that's a terrible thing in the life of the child of Israel. Then the two sons, Malon and Kilion, they married there, and they married pagan women. Another very negative thing. Against the law of God and often the tragic results. Then they both die, leaving no children. So Naomi is left with no husband, no sons, no grandchildren, and in her own heart and mind, no future. And then, after about 10 years, she comes to her senses, much like the prodigal in Jesus' parable. She comes to her senses and realizes this isn't where she should be. She should be back home, in Israel, in Bethlehem, among the covenant people. She tells her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, to go back to their families in Moab, and back to their culture, back to their way of life there, Orpah does. Ruth says no. Ruth instead makes this incredible, beautiful, lifetime, unconditional <laughs> commitment to Naomi. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you die, I'll die. And there I'll be buried. Wow. And she makes this commitment to Naomi's people. Your people will be my people. I don't want to be a Moabite any longer. I will be one of the children of Israel together with you. And your God, the living God, the Lord God, the Almighty, will be my God. It's an incredible commitment. And then Ruth and Naomi head back, come to Bethlehem just at the time of the barley harvest is beginning. The last time we saw um, Naomi, and we mentioned that there's really two stories going on here at the same time, the story of Ruth, but also the story of Naomi. And last time we really focused on Naomi, and we saw what a dark place she was in. We saw how hurt she was and how bitter she had become. Um, she couldn't get past those, all those things that happened in her life, and she was filled with bitterness toward God. We noticed even that she called herself Mara. Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. She blamed God, and she was bitter toward God. And now we come to chapter 2, and we're going to be working our way through chapter 2 this morning. Before we do, let's pray. Lord, we're about to open your word together. We're about to read these words. Uh, we can do that, Lord. But they only contain a blessing for us if you open them for us. If you enlighten our minds and our hearts. And if your spirit um, makes them powerful. We know you can do that, Lord. And we pray for that. We pray that indeed you would speak to us. Pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. Boaz, we, we met him last week. We, looked, we read verse 1 last week just to meet Boaz. And we know he's going to play an important role in the story. You can just tell that, by the way, that He's brought into it here, and indeed he does. plays a very pivotal role. But notice a couple of things about him right now. One is that he's a relative of Elimelech's. Now that's important, and we'll see how that's important later, but it's very important. And notice number two, that he's a man of standing, it says. Um, the ESV, English Standard Version, translated, translates it, he was a worthy man. Um, it means that he was an important man in Israel. Um, 
he was a man of character and he was a godly man. This is Boaz. It's important to know him. Verse 2 and 3. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of the Elimelech. A couple things. First of all, she went out to glean. Now this was a common thing in Israel. There was a provision in the law of God for this very thing. There's a provision that the poor in Israel could glean in the fields of the harvest. In fact, the harvesters, according to the law, were not to go back to pick up anything they dropped or anything they missed. They were to leave that for the poor. And they were not to harvest the corners of their field. They were to leave those corners for the poor. And so poor people would come and they would follow after the harvesters and they'd gather the grain that was left in the corners. And this was, if you will, a part of the welfare system of Israel. It was a way to uh, provide for the poor, but also to maintain the dignity of work. Boy, this is something our government could learn from. Yeah. That's enough about that. <laughs> Notice also that it just so happened that she gleaned in the field of Boaz. Uh, notice how it says it in the verse. It says, as it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. Uh, this is a, a literary technique that's called hyperbolic irony. Hyperbolic irony. And you go, whoa, that's impressive. But the idea is that it's stated this way to show that this wasn't by chance at all. It didn't just happen to be the case that she gleaned in that field. As it turned out, this was the providence of God that she goes to this field to harvest the grain, to glean. God's directing her. God's way ahead of what's going on here. And the Lord directs her. And as it turned out, she found herself harvesting in this field by God's direction. He brought her right here. You know, friends, this is the way we see it in Scripture over and over again. In the stories of Scripture, we find that God is working things out for His purposes. And this is the way it is in our own lives, too. Isn't it? <coughs> Brothers and sisters, God is the great multitasker. He wastes nothing. And He's always working in our lives. And He's directing us. He's always at work. Many times we do not see it when we're in the midst of it. Isn't it true? I mean, I'm talking to people who lived a bit of life here. When we're in the midst of it, many times we don't see how God's working. It's when we look back that we can see it. Karen and I, um, last November we celebrated our 15th anniversary, although because of COVID we couldn't really celebrate it with the kids and everything like we wanted. But 50 years, you know, and as we look back, here together 
in this place. Do you guys have a miracle of that? The Lord has worked in every one of our lives so that we would be together in this place this morning looking at this scripture. To me, that's staggering. On so many levels. I mean, let me just tell you. Marble, Michigan was never on my radar. It wasn't. When I was a teenager, I came to the drag strip a few times. Way out there in the boonies. But the Lord's going, hey, Denny, you're going to be there. You're going to be there. And you're going to pastor a church there. And your two daughters are going to marry guys from that church. And you're going to come back there because you love the place so much. When you retire, you're going to come back to Martin. And you know what? I have an appointment to you at East Martin Christian Reformed Church on September 27. I think that's right, Dave. Isn't it? I hope that's right. Anyway, whatever the date is today, to preach because I have someone there who needs to hear what you're going to say. And you need to say what you're going to say. And so I'm going to work everything in the universe so that we are together this morning in this place. Is that staggering or what? Wow. Okay. I remember a professor in seminary, I really didn't care for him. But he did say some good things. And one thing he said was this. That our lives as Christians are like rowing a rowboat. You know, when you row a rowboat, you don't see much of what's ahead. You just catch a glimpse once in a while. Most of you see is what's behind. What's behind? And when you look behind, you see that God has been active, guiding, directing. That when you were praying, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, that's exactly what he did. Thank you. 
privilege of serving was Fourth Reform Church in Grand Rapids, north side of Grand Rapids. And I had a wonderful secretary there. Her name was Mary Kay. And Mary Kay made a cross stitch for me that has been on one of my walls ever since, usually hanging in one of my offices along the way to different churches they serve and so on. And it's a picture of a young boy on a swing. And, and he's like forward on the swing, and his face is looking up towards the sun, and he's just soaking up the rays of the sun. And then she stitched in this scripture, Psalm 31, 16. Make thy face shine upon thy servant. That's the idea. Koram devil. Living in the presence of God. In the awareness of the presence of God. In the awareness of his favor. God loves me. He really does. I mean, it's a staggering thought. It's like, why would he? When he knows me so well. <laughs> but he does. He loves you. He looks at you, if you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, He looks at you as His child, His precious child that He loves. And He looks at you with a smile on His face. And living Koram Devil is, is living in the awareness of that and soaking up the goodness of that. That's how I want to live. I don't always look that way, I've got to tell you. That's how I want to live. I want to live with a sense of a smile on my life. And that shows even in the way we talk. You see, the Lord bless you. Yeah, we should talk more like that. Because talking like that reminds us of the fact that we are always living in the presence of God. It's almost like we become ashamed to use spiritual language. That's even the case with some of us as pastors. I've come to really love some brothers in the ministry who don't who aren't ashamed to say to me, you know, can the Lord really bless you tomorrow as you preach? And may the Lord really bless you as you do that. And then I can say the same thing back to them. Because we believe it. We believe in our need for the Lord to do that. And, and we want to live in the awareness of His presence. So, shoot, we got to yeah, move along here, folks. Why are you slowing me up like this? You know, friends, I really love being here. I'm, I'm loving this. I hope you realize that. <coughs> Verse 5. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? Whose young woman is that? Now, I, I don't think you read that verse, you might think that what he's saying is, you know, whose servant is that? Well, I may be saying that, but I don't think so. I, I think, you see, Bethlehem is a small town. Now I know that we don't live in a small town. <laughs> but small town life, people like to know where people fit. You know what I mean? Especially in the Dutch community. Uh, we hear somebody's name and the first thing we go is, oh, are you so-and-so's brother? Is that your brother? Is that... We play Dutch bingo, don't we? Where, where do you fit? We want to know where you fit. I think that's what's going on here. I remember Karen and I, we, we uh, lived in Hall, Iowa for a year. I taught in a Christian school there in Hall, Iowa for a year. And that's a small town, too. And I remember when we moved there, I went to the bank to open an account. And, and the gal at the bank says to me, she's got this form in front of me, and she says, um, where's his address? You just... 801 3rd Street. And I looked at her and I said, I didn't tell you my address. She goes, I know, but you're the new teacher, right? At, uh... <laughs> I mean, my experience up to that point was, like, you're anonymous to everybody except you want to reveal yourself to. All of a sudden, I'm in this town where everybody knows who I am before I even get there. That's the way it is in small town life, isn't it? Well, that's the situation here, too. He looks and he goes, I don't recognize that woman. Where does she fit? Okay, I should 
carry my Bible down there. And then in verse 6 through 9, the foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, three is let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. Well, what do we see here? Well, we see something about Ruth's character and something about Boaz's character. First about Ruth, we see she's a hard-working young woman. They said, good grief, she hasn't even taken a break except one time when she stopped to rest. Well, otherwise, she's been working since morning. And she even asked permission, which she didn't have to do because it was the law that said that she could. Well, that's Ruth. But we also see Boaz's character. Here he is looking out for this person that he doesn't know. He's concerned that she be protected. He's concerned that she's taken care of. Why? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 10 through 12. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you noticed me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. Why? Why have I noticed you? Why am I looking out for you this way? Well, it's not some superficial thing. It's not because you're pretty or something like that, or just because I'm just nice to strangers. No, I know, I've heard all about you. Now I put name and face together. I've heard about you, and I've heard about what you've done. I've heard about the costly commitment that you made. I've heard about how you left your home, your family, your gods, you left your culture behind in order to come here. You, you, you did that in order to be a support to Naomi, but also you did that because you sought refuge under the wings of the Lord. And that kind of commitment moves me. And I want to do what I can to help support that kind of commitment. Brothers and sisters, I think it's obvious that we need to have that same sort of heart. That we need to, when we see someone in the midst of this mixed up, crazy, sin-cursed world, when we see someone make a costly commitment to the Lord, <laughs> well, we need to be right there for them. In whatever way we can. Supporting them, encouraging them, if, if we're an employer and they need a job, maybe find a job for them. If we're a church and it's somebody who's in need, we come underneath that person and help support them as they try to live their life. Because this sort of commitment to the Lord should move us deeply. Just like it did for Boaz. That's why he's doing what he's doing. He's, he's not trying to gain anything out of this himself. He just simply sees the commitment she's made, and he wants to support it. It's a marvelous, beautiful thing. Notice also, if you would, the phrase at the end of verse 12. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. You know, I read that, and it just kind of arrests me. So you can read Read that, read right by it, and on to the story. But friends, there's a picture here, isn't there? It's an incredible picture. It's a picture of God, and it's a picture of the person who comes to the Lord, who trusts in the Lord. First of all, it's a picture of God. It's an amazing picture. He's pictured, if you will, like a mother bird. 
under whose wings you come for refuge. He's pictured as this mother bird or father bird, but it's usually the mother bird that does this, right? That gathers the chicks under her wings. Now, when the chicks are on their own, when they're out there on their own, they're very vulnerable, right? Predators can get them very easily. But when they're under the wings of the parent bird, they're safe. Because the parent bird becomes fiercely protective when the chicks are under the wings of that parent bird. And that's the picture we have here of our God. This is our God. He's fiercely protective of those who come to refuge, for refuge in Him. And He, he puts His wings, if you will, around them and holds them close. And friends, this is also a powerful picture of those who trust in Jesus. We're, we're pictured, if you will, as, as chicks who come to hide under the wings of the Almighty God. This is who Ruth is, but this is also us, isn't it? This is us. And I love this picture. That's why I titled the message what I did, Under His Wings. In fact, in my own mind, that's been the title for the whole series. I just haven't shared that with you. But Under His Wings. It's such an incredible picture. I'm not ashamed at all to say that that's me, under the wings of God. I need thee every hour, O oh precious Lord. That isn't just a song, is it? That's true, isn't it? If you have lived a little bit of life, you know it's true. I need thee every hour, O oh precious Lord. And I'm under the wings of the Almighty. What a powerful, wonderful picture it is. Lord, hold me. Lord, pull your feathers around us, Lord. Hold us tight. Hold us tight. This is what we read in our call to worship this morning. Psalm 61, verse 4. I long to go in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Psalm 91, verse 4. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Now back to the story. Verse 13 through 16. Ruth continues speaking. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted, had some left over, and put it in a doggy bag. I'm not kidding. We'll see. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. Boaz continues to be caring for her. Let's go on. Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it mounted into about an ephah, which the footnote tells us about three-fifths of a bushel. Uh, I read somewhere else that it's like 30 to 40 pounds worth of grains for a bit. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. In other words, the doggy bag. She brought out the doggy bag, gave it to her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Because normally you wouldn't get, get this much grain. Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is her close relative. 
He is one of our kinsmen, redeemers. Friends, here we see a really important development in the story. And in a word, it's the return of hope. Now, brothers and sisters, we all need hope, don't we, in our lives? We need hope in order to live. And for us as Christians, the hope ultimately is that blessed hope of the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the scripture calls it a blessed hope. But we all need hope. We need to live in hope. And, and you know we needed hope, too. Last time we saw that she was in a dark place. She was bitter. She felt like the Lord was active in her life, all right, but in a negative way, he kept smacking her, hitting her. But now, she sees evidence of his grace. Now, in the NIV, we read that, you might not see that immediately. When it says, when it says he has not stopped showing his kindness, you might think that he refers to Boaz, but it doesn't. Uh, the ESV translates it this way. May he, Boaz, be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living of the dead. She sees Boaz doing it, yes, but she sees even more. God is doing it. God is showing kindness. And hope begins to return to her heart. It changes everything. It's the beginning of the end of her bitterness. As we see in the story, as we continue to see it, it's the beginning of the end of her bitterness, beginning of the end of her feeling forsaken. She sees a new evidence of God's grace that changes everything. And brothers and sisters, the same thing can be true in our lives. The last time that we looked at Naomi, we spent a lot of time on it. If you were here, actually the whole message was just on a few verses. We saw that Naomi was bitter because of the hard circumstances of her life, and, and we saw how we can be, too, and that we can get stuck. I mean, we can really get stuck. And it really doesn't take that much. You can start with something pretty minor, but there's a downward spiral, and we can become, get to a place that isn't a very pretty place, a bitter place, an angry place, a place where we don't see the goodness of God in our lives, and it sucks the joy of God in our life. But when that happens, like we said last time, we need to hang on to the knot that we've tied. The, the knot that is the assurance from the word of God that God isn't against us, he's for us. And that he loves us with a love that cannot be altered or changed. Nothing can separate us from that love. And that he goes with us. And that he hasn't forsaken us. But he's, he's with us. And we need to hang on to that knot, especially until we see some new evidence of his grace. Just like, just like Naomi sees here, she sees new evidence of his grace and it changes her at a very deep level. And the same thing can be true in our lives. When we see a new evidence of his grace, and we will, because God loves us and we'll see new evidences of his grace, where his mercies are new every morning. We need to hang on to that knot until we see that. One more thing, really. Um, I want us to notice that where at the end of verse um, 20, it says, that man is a close relative. He's one of our kinsmen, redeemers. Kinsman, redeemer. Would you say that word with me, please? Kinsman, redeemer. Now, kinsman, redeemer is exactly what the word says. A kinsman who's a redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is, first of all, a kinsman. Someone closely related to another person who is in trouble. Perhaps a brother of that person, or an uncle, or a cousin, but a close relative of a person who is in trouble, has some difficulty. And the second thing is that they're a redeemer. Um, the idea is that they literally stand in the place of that other person. So that, for example, maybe that other person, that close relative, maybe um, is enslaved because they weren't able to pay their debts or whatever. And the kinsman redeemer pays the price of their debts so that they can be released from slavery. Or maybe that relative has had their land 
taken from them because of their debts or whatever, and they've lost title to the land, the kinsman redeemer stands in their place and pays whatever it is so that they can repossess the land, not for them, but for that relative. Or it can be that a person, a man, dies and he hasn't had any children. And the kinsman redeemer actually would marry the wife of that person who died. And when they would have children, if they had a son, that firstborn son became um, not that man's son, but the son of the one who died. He takes the name of the one who died so that he continued that line in Israel, so that lineage wouldn't be lost. So that, that family wouldn't lose its place among the covenant people of God. It was an incredibly important position. A kinsman was redeemer. Not just anybody, a kinsman. It has to be family, close family, and it's a redeemer. Now, we'll see in the story when we get to chapters 3 and 4 next time how important that is in the story. It's an incredibly important role and uh, it has deep significance. In Israel. Well, this is Boaz. Not just a nice man, not just a worthy man, but a kinsman redeemer. Let's finish up the chapter, shall we? Verse 21 through 23. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter in law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls because. In someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the serve girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest, both harvests, barley and wheat harvest, were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Yes, it was good for her to stay with Boaz girls, and we'll see how it plays out next week. Let's pray. The word of your word is fascinating. Even a story like this that we've Many of us here anyway, Lord, we've, we've heard many times, we've read it many times. But yet as we look closely at it again, Lord, new things pop out at us and we see the beauty of it. Lord, that's the wonder of your word. And Lord, we pray that these things might go with us in this day. <coughs> that we might be changed by it. Lord, rekindle our hope if we're caught in in feeling that you're not for us as you should be. Rekindle our hope, I pray. And Lord, help us to live in the awareness of your presence in our lives. And see your smile. And so that your grace. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing together, and guess what song we're going to sing? Under his wings. Let's rise as the music begins and sing together.
hand upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and fill you even to overflowing with his peace.